Presiding Judge Keller, Senator Whitmire, Senator Norris, distinguished guests, we convene once again in the spirit of Sergeant Joe Friday. Just the facts, ma'am, just the facts. In a society that is hard driven by opinion, we reassert as our creed here that best policy <coughs> is based on facts derived from research and data. But facts are sometimes buried in convention and bias, and digging them out of experience is hard, careful work. For the business end of that shovel, none has proved more incisive, accurate, productive, and relevant than Dr. Tony Fabello and the staff of the Council of State Government's Justice Center. In 2011, my predecessor and friend, uh, Chief Justice Wallace Jefferson, hosted the CSG Justice Center's release of a school discipline study, Breaking Schools Rules. This compelled policymakers in Texas and nationally to adjust their thinking regarding school discipline. Then in June 2013, we reconvened here in this courtroom to launch the CSG Justice Center's School Discipline Consensus Report, providing strategies to reduce school suspensions and improve learning conditions for all youth. Today, I am pleased to host the CSG Justice Center once again for the release of its latest report, Closer to Home, an analysis of the state and local impact of the Texas juvenile justice system reform. Closer to Home attempts to answer this question. How can the juvenile justice system produce better youth while satisfying the law's demands for order and protecting public safety? After all, the ultimate goal of the justice system is the best life for all of our youth who find themselves in it. Since 2007, the Texas legislature has engaged in reforms to reduce the number of youth incarcerated in state facilities, direct more resources to juvenile courts and probation departments, and treat justice-involved youth closer to home. As you will hear today, many of these efforts have been successful. The report, Closer to Home, is about doing more. I've opened the courtroom of the Supreme Court of Texas to you because the court is deeply committed to improving the justice system for youth and families, to which end our permanent judicial commission for children, youth, and families is also dedicated and has been operating effectively for years. We open the courtroom also because these issues are a priority for us as the third branch of government and also because here, opinion is driven by facts and the law. So, welcome to the Supreme Court of Texas. No one in Texas government has been a stronger, more effective champion of juvenile justice reform than Senator John Whitmire, and I turn the program over to him. Good morning, and uh, it's very uh, pleasing to see so how many people are here today. Uh, I've got a couple of acknowledgments to make, but let me just tell you what was on my mind sitting there, having been in the legislature 42 years, 10 in the House, 32 in the Senate. We talk about a lot in state government, higher education, water, public safety, transportation, and you, the list goes on and on. But from my experience as a legislator, the House and the Senate, Your Honor, I can't think of a more serious, important topic than juvenile justice and the information that we're going to learn and discuss today. So from the, from the global perspective, this is why you run for office, quite frankly, the opportunity to participate in studies and the results and reforms that we're gathered here to discuss today. Uh, Chief Justice Heck, uh, you, you show your commitment and the state's commitment by opening the Supreme Court. Uh, 
some of us lawyers, this is the only way we'll ever get here, <laughs> is to have the opportunity to come participate in a program. But uh, thank you, and, and, and your leadership is vitally important. And Judge Keller, presiding judge of the Court of Criminal Appeals, you've been a partner from the very beginning. I could go throughout our audience, some local judges, advocates, probation chiefs, parents, obviously, by your presence today, you show your commitment and reaffirm how important this is to council of state governments. Uh, my colleague from Tennessee, majority leader, uh, Senator Norris, thank you for allowing the study to go forward in results. Uh, the uh, foundations that support this are so important. But let me just put a face on what got us here. I've been chairing criminal justice since 93. Bob Bullock called me in. It was, it was a dysfunctional system, a revolving door. We had 60,000 adult inmates with 30,000 backed up sleeping on county jail floors. You served about a month for every year that you were sentenced. And when he asked me to chair it, I thought the fix was on. I'd already been in the legislature 30 years. I thought somebody knows how to get rid of me. <laughs> Give me that assignment. And I have publicly acknowledged that I rolled up my sleeve with Tony Fabello and others, and we worked on the adult system around the clock many, many days when we were in session. And so we went forward, and I have publicly acknowledged this. Juvenile justice was largely out of sight, out of mind. I was so overwhelmed with the adult problems, so massive, so extensive that quite frankly the juvenile justice was just out there, out of sight, out of mind. Rural settings, we would hear from the director of the agency. Bob Bullock's son-in-law was the effective director for many years, so we just literally out of sight, out of mind with juvenile justice. Then in 2007, with about 5,000 students confined across the state, about 14 facilities. Remember, I'm still focused on 150,000 adults at 108 locations, $3 billion a year. They're in the crisis mode almost daily. We were trying to resolve the adult system. We got an alert that there was a scandal having been committed in West Texas in one of these remote, out of sight, out of mind juvenile facilities. Youth were being sexually assaulted by staff. We got alarmed, we got Texas Rangers involved, and we started devoting attention that it deserved the juvenile justice system. Out of sight, out of mind was no longer the standard. They're at the front, at the table. We got busy, Jerry Madden, a full-time partner with many of the stakeholders, juvenile probation chiefs, pro uh, prosecutors, families, and our commitment was no longer that we would focus on the youth and we quickly realized the out of sight model is not going to work. So I became committed along with my colleagues and many of you in this room, keep the kids at home. I'm excited to tell you today from 5,000 in 2007, we're down to five facilities and this morning there's 980 kids. We made, with your advice and counsel, you have to commit a felony to be confined by the state of Texas in a youth facility. So you say, where did the youth go? They're in their communities. They're in the juvenile probation programs. And I will quickly sit down so we can go to work by saying the data is going to show that our objective to getting them back in their community has been very successful. And I, for one, that was my goal. Well, now I've learned that's just part of our objective. We're going to learn that we're doing a great job at depopulating the state, and I'll close later with tell you some legislative plans. But this morning we're going to discuss, if you keep them at home, what is the outcome? We're going to find some probation and communities do better jobs than others, and we're going to learn a lot. And I just can't thank Michael Thompson, and I'm going to call on him now. He's the director of the Justice Center for the hard work and the professional staff that you use to inform us today. So let me say thank you for being here. Let's go to work.
Thomas. Good morning. Uh, Michael Thompson, I'm the Director of the Council of State Governments Justice Center. I'm going to have a long list of thank yous that I want to go through in just a minute, but uh, right now there's two people in particular I want to thank. And uh, first, the person who just uh, turned it over to me, uh, the Dean of the Senate, Senator Whitmire. Thank you, sir, for all you have done to continue to bring us back to the numbers. Uh, time and time again, you said it's not just enough uh, to know what people are saying about the system. I want to take a hard look at the numbers. Uh, and that kind of approach, that data-driven approach, is really something now that the rest of the country is following. Whether it's been school discipline or now this topic of juvenile justice, you set the whole path on a country, uh, you set the whole country on a path that I don't think we would have been but for your efforts. So thank you very much, Senator Whitmire. And to the Chief Justice for hosting us uh, and your terrific team, David Slayton, thank you very, very much for all you've done to open up this courtroom for these kinds of conversations. Uh, many of you may not, many of you all know, or all of you know, what a fantastic uh, state leader Chief Justice Hecht is and how he shepherds the court system here. What you may not know is that when all the state Supreme Court Chief Justices got together uh, just a couple of days ago, uh, they met right here in Texas, uh, and Chief Justice Hecht hosted them, clearly a national leader among all Chief Justices. I'll have also uh, great things to say about our board member and past chair, presiding Judge Sharon Keller. But at this moment, I want to turn it over to uh, the Senate Majority Leader from Tennessee, who is the past chairman um, of the Council of State Governments. Uh, those in Tennessee and those of us at the Council of State Governments know there is no topic that Senator Norris is more passionate about than children and families. And I know it was incredibly important for him to be able to pull away from the legislative session in Tennessee and be able to talk to you not only about how important what you're doing is here in Texas, but for us generally at the Council of State Governments and for state legislatures everywhere. So I give to you the Senate Majority Leader from Tennessee and our past chairman, Senator Mark Norris. Thank you. Thank you, Mike. Thank you, ladies and gentlemen, Mr. Chief Justice, uh, our presiding judge, Sharon Keller, thank you very much, your honors. It's, it's a great honor to be here. And, and I don't want to speak uh, long enough to interfere with this morning's proceedings because they're very important. I, I like to tell my legislative colleagues in Texas as often as I can to remember that if it weren't for Tennessee, there would be no Texas. <laughs> now that he's at the opposite end of the table. But seriously, today we're here, Tennessee and all the rest of us are here to look at all the good work that is being done in Texas by Texans and to use this as a model that all of us can use to demonstrate at home improvements we can have in our own system. I did want to put in context one small but very important fact, and that is that none of this would be possible if it weren't for the Council of State Governments, and our Executive Director David Atkins is here in the front row, and the southern region of the Council of State Governments, which is SLC, the Southern Legislative Conference of the Council of State Governments, and our Executive Director, Colleen Cousineau, is immediately behind me there in the second row. This is the organization that gave life to the Justice Center. And it's the Justice Center, which in turn has given life to these very important projects that bring value, not only to the state of Texas, but to states all across the United States and all three branches of government in each state. So that's another reason I'm here. Juvenile justice and improvements in Tennessee are one of my focuses here in 2015 and beyond. But I want you all to appreciate the fact that if it weren't for CSG and the Southern Legislative Conference, none of this might have been possible. So ladies and gentlemen, thank you all very much. Mike, thank you, Justice Center, your honors. I'm looking forward to today's proceedings and looking forward to carrying this good news back to Tennessee. Thank you so much. Thank you very much, Senator Norris. Um, I'm now going to introduce uh, two speakers uh, who represent private foundations and public charities that made this study possible. First, I want to call up uh, Nate Bayless, who's the director of the Juvenile Justice Strategy Group at the Annie E. Casey Foundation, which is headquartered in Baltimore, Maryland. For many of you who've been working in juvenile justice, you know that it's been the work of the Annie E. Casey Foundation that's really propelled reforms across the country. Nate Bayless has been working on juvenile justice issues for more than 15 years, spearheads their work now, and is a huge reason why we're here today. So Nate Bayless, thank you very much for joining us. Good morning, Mike, thanks so much for the warm introduction. Uh, it's really a pleasure to be here today 
You know, over the past two decades, the Andy Casey Foundation has worked with states and localities around the country on juvenile justice reform, primarily on safely reducing the use of secure detention and incarceration, um, but also as a national voice advocating for the use of data as part of system reform. That's really what drove us to this study and why we were so happy to support it, because it's a unique opportunity to really look inside of a juvenile justice system in a way that, frankly, no one else has really done before. So um, I want to congratulate, of course, the researchers at the Council of State Governments Justice Center and at Texas A&M Public Policy Research Institute on their ingenuity in assembling and doing this analysis. It's an incredible task, and it's going to have huge contributions for the field. But even more so, we want to applaud the state, the state of Texas, um, state and local officials who are here today and around the state. Uh, this is, again, the idea of opening up your doors, saying, not only to take on the issue of juvenile justice reform, but then being able to say, so how did we do? What does it look like? And then being committed to taking the next step forward to making it better is really a model for states to follow around the country. So I applaud you for that. Um, you know, the implications of this research, again, will have huge contributions for the field overall. And, and I think the report really does that in several ways, and, and uh, if you don't mind, I'm going to go through them, and, and not to steal any of the thunder from Mike, but I think it's important to sort of hammer home these messages. I think there's five real ways it does this. You know, the first is this report bolsters the already overwhelming evidence that confining young people, as Senator Whitmire said, confining young people in large correctional facilities far from their homes is a failed strategy. Um, second, it reinforces the evidence showing that residential confinement of any type should be used sparingly and only when there's a public safety risk. Um, this report shows that in both the sense of the number of young people who are going to residential facilities and how long they stay. Third, I would say more than any publication or research project in recent memory, this report highlights the reality that policies, practices, and programs employed by local courts and probation agencies matter. Right? They're pivotally important to what works in the juvenile justice system. Fourth, I would say, the report illustrates the importance of comprehensive system reform, a central theme of the Annie Casey Foundation over the years, not only in our work in juvenile justice, but in child welfare and other policy matters that focus on the well-being of children around the country. Um, advancing policy reform and funding programs is essential, but it's not sufficient. It's not sufficient if we want to change outcomes and change them at scale for children and families around the country. Comprehensive system reform requires a coordinated system that places the right youth in the right program or no program right, for the right reasons, a system characterized by collaboration, effective use of data, careful attention to research and results, and let's, let us not forget vigilant attention to racial and ethnic equity. And finally, I'd say the report underlines the critical importance of state leadership, which is a real important part of this study overall, in promoting the effective practices and maximizing success at the local level. Um, the Texas deserves to be applauded for dramatically reducing the number of youth in state custody and for redirecting a healthy share of resources back to the community. Um, but I think this report also suggests that those steps are not alone, that counties need guidance, they need training, and they need proper incentives to maximize their likelihood of success. Uh, I would say these are common issues from state to state. I think the great news here in Texas is that you're way ahead of the curve. And I'd say you're ahead of the curve both because of the reforms already implemented and because of the constructive action that this re report demands. You know, juvenile justice reform cannot just be a moment in time. Continuous system improvement is something that requires ongoing attention, and I applaud Texas for being willing to do that. Thank you. Thank you so much for having me today. Uh, the other foundation that made this study possible is the Pew Charitable Trusts, uh, and in particular the Public Safety Performance Project. And we're thrilled to have with us today Craig Prinz, who is the research director for the Pew Charitable Trusts Public Safety Performance Project. Uh, Craig has a long history of working on these issues before he joined Pew. He was counsel to the House and Senate Judiciary Committees uh, in uh, Oregon, and he was also the director of the Criminal Justice Commission. Craig, thank you so much for being here today. Uh, thank you so much. It's, um, I am from Oregon, and I, so I hope you'll let me make a uh, 
duck illusion. It won't be about football. <laughs> Because uh, it's still January, so it's the time of year when uh, all of us from Oregon are, uh, have a recent loss and a national championship to think about. Um, it's also January. It's time when we, um, in my family, we did our um, New Year's resolutions. And our resolution was to, to count our, our blessings and things we're thankful for. And so I walked to, uh, what was it called, Sweet Swedish Hill Bakery this morning. And I thought about some of the, um, the, the things I'm thankful for here in, in Texas. And one... I think Nate hit them all, but it's the leadership you have, it's the partners we have, and it's the capacity you all have to do research that really is a, a combination that makes you a leader, and it makes us proud to work with you. So on behalf of the uh, Pew Charitable Trust, I want to thank you and congratulate you. Um, I think Nate uh, outlined um, uh, some really important points, and I just wanted to ground those in um, some of the public polling that the Pew Charitable Trusts have done. A recent poll revealed that 84% of voters do not care if juvenile offenders are sent to these correct, large correctional facilities or how long they stay there. What matters to the public is reducing the likelihood of future crime. That's what our, uh, our folks want us to look at, and we think that this report fits well in moving forward on that. 85% of the voters agreed that status offenders should not go to correctional facilities. I think uh, the senator uh, spoke to that. And I think that this report is along that vein. Almost 9 in 10 voters think schools, families, and social service agendas should deal with low-level offenses and not this type of justice system response that you all, are, uh, you all are shaping in that direction, too. So these reforms are based upon data. They're based upon the strong partnerships you have. They're based upon the leadership you have. And they're based on what the public wants. So I congratulate the, the leadership here of, uh, in Texas. Uh, thank you for having us here uh, in the Supreme Court Center. Thank you for your leadership. Um, thank you, CSG, for being a, a great partner. And uh, also, Nate, thank you. And then I, I wanted to make my uh, duck reference, which goes to Tony and uh, Nancy and the CSG. Um, a duck looks smooth above the water, but below the water, there's a lot of, of work that goes into this. Um, to do this type of report uh, with a mi over a million records and this type of meticulous and rigorous evaluation that you all have takes an amazing amount of work. And you have uh, someone to be very thankful for here. Um, you have a real resource to work from. Tony walked me through around his office last night and uh, showed me a picture of some of the old, uh, of Rick Kern, one of my old mentors. Uh, Tony's roots, I know, run deep here in Texas, but they're national too, and he's a real, um, you have a real research capacity to, uh, to, to draw from. So I just want to congratulate you all, and I want to thank you very much for letting us be a part of this. Thank you. Great. Thank you very much, Craig. Um, I'm also was asked earlier to make an announcement for those of you who are standing. There's a, a few seats that I think are uh, maybe still in between. Maybe you can get to. If not, there's an overflow room too where you can also sit uh, and watch the the PowerPoint presentation. Um, I mentioned earlier that there were some additional people that I wanted to thank. So I hope you'll bear with me before we get to the reason you're here, which is to see the report findings and then talk to the people who are going to be following up on them. Um, I thanked Senator Whitmire earlier uh, and Chief Justice Hecht, and I just want to also reiterate my thanks to the people behind them who make things happen. David Slayton, uh, the State Court Administrator here, and Tara, thank you for all that you do uh, to really make things run uh, behind the scenes. Um, I mentioned earlier that we were very fortunate to have as one of our founding board members, presiding Judge Sharon Keller and a past chairperson. Um, she's been instrumental in really driving our work in Texas, and Judge Keller, thank you, thank you for all that you continue to do to make it possible for the Justice Center. Uh, my colleagues at the uh, CSG were recognized earlier, David Atkins and Colin Cousineau, thank you again for being here. Um, I want to turn to the great leadership that the Texas Juvenile Justice Department has had, because that is what has made this study possible. We have with us today uh, Director Riley, but it was also his predecessors uh, in Mike Griffiths and Jay Kimbrough, who were uh, instrumental in making this study happen, making the data available for us to analyze it. Thank you uh, to TJJD. Uh, and, and all the people over there. Uh, to Deborah Fowler uh, from Texas Appleseed, um, who is a skilled advocate uh, on these issues, but also incredibly knowledgeable about the nuts and bolts uh, of the data. She has provided invaluable advice uh, along the way. Deborah, thank you for all that you have done. Now I turn to um, the report authors who are uh, listed 
um, on the report. There are some very, very smart people uh, at Texas A&M. Um, I think they wear like kind of white lab coats and then all the lights dim whenever they run numbers uh, late at night. Uh, Dr. Trey Marchbanks, Dr. Austin Clements, thank you very much for all you've done to process the 1.3 million records that we keep referencing. I uh, really appreciate all of your help. Um, Karen Watts is sitting somewhere watching this um, at home because she was working until literally the midnight hour making last minute changes to this. Karen, thank you for all that you've done in, in helping edit the report. Um, a key author on this um, is Nancy Aragona. Nancy, thank you very, very much for all you've done. Uh, ask Nancy where she was Christmas Day, New Year's Eve, uh, New Year's Day, and all the holidays before that. And uh, she'll probably tell you with a blush, I know her husband will tell us forcefully, um, you know, uh, she was in front of the computer working on this report. Nancy, thank you very much for all that you've done. I've saved um, for last uh, the person that you can probably imagine, the mastermind of this entire report, uh, Dr. Tony Fabello. His name has already been referenced uh, several times. Um, no one knows uh, the halls of the legislature better. His 18th legislative session, uh, as many of you um, know, it's kind of awkward, frankly, for me to be giving a presentation uh, that Tony and Dr. Fabello uh, was actually the, the mastermind. Uh, the only conclusion I can make is that he wanted the G version uh, here. Um, the rated R version will be delivered by Tony somewhere else uh, after hours. So um, <clears throat> uh, I guess that's why I'm doing this. So um, again, to all of you, uh, thank you very, very much for um, ha making this possible. And uh, with that, I now want to walk through uh, the uh, study findings. And I may ask um, Robert Coombs for a little bit of uh, help, just because I need to call this up so I can see it a little bit better uh, on the screen. Um, and, but what I'm going to do here is really have uh, three parts to the study. Uh, the first is around the overview and methodology. Um, and then I'm going to walk through the key questions that this report answers. Uh, and then I'm going to uh, explain the important uh, takeaways and next steps. Uh, so first, um, we make it bigger. Okay. Uh, so first, I want to walk you through the um, very quickly. Senator Whitmire alluded to uh, the major changes that have occurred uh, in juvenile justice policy here, and talked about, uh, in particular, uh, the legislature hearing um, the results of a number of news stories highlighting uh, scandal in the system and the effort to really downsize the system. And so, in uh, 2007, Robert, I think you're still sort of a sorry. In 2007, uh, the legislature took its first actions to significantly downsize the system. Many of you are um, familiar with this, including prohibiting the commitment to state-run secure facilities for youth um, who had been uh, charged uh, with a misdemeanor offense. Uh, a number of other reforms that you all are familiar with. Um, the juvenile justice population uh, in state-run secure facilities has since declined. Uh, steadily, uh, and additional reforms have followed. Um, as Nate said, this is um, not the kind of issue that just simply gets tackled uh, at one particular moment in time. And indeed, if you look at the work of the legislature and work with the executive branch and the judiciary, this is something that has occurred over a number of years. Uh, and now we see the number of kids who are in state-run secure facilities at a historic low here in Texas. The declines that have occurred here in Texas um, uh, are not something uh, that's unique to Texas. In fact, when we look across the country, we've seen huge declines in the number of kids in state-run secure facilities. And this is one of the reasons why we think this report has such national significance. Um, this is a uh, bar graph showing you declines in nearly all of the states. 47 of the 50 states have seen not just small declines, but declines um, approaching even 80% in some states of the numbers of kids in state secure facilities. Um, the three states that you see listed here, uh, or four states that have seen increases, um, those states are literally working as we speak uh, to make declines uh, and make, the, uh, make sure that they can join the states that have also enjoyed declines. What distinguishes Texas, as was referenced earlier, was this inquiry that came in from TJJD and from Senator Whitmire which was, it's not just enough that the census is lower. We want to know what's happened to those kids. What difference um, are the strategies that we're making in those kids' lives? How has it impacted public safety? And that was the request uh, that we got um, uh, late in, tw in 2012 from Senator Whitmire and TJJD leaders. What then followed was the most extraordinary data set that's ever been assembled. And for a lot of people, this is where their eyes glaze over. But for geeks like us, this is where we get really excited. Um, more than 1.3 million records uh, assembled from three statewide databases over an eight-year period. Uh, TJJD took uh, records corresponding to almost half a million youth 
uh, who'd been in contact with the probation system, and um, uh, 14,000 youth uh, who'd been in state secure facilities over an eight year period. They then went to, uh, TDP, uh, to DPS, Texas Department of Public Safety, and to TDCJ, and they then found the criminal histories for those youth, arrest records, uh, incarceration in state-run facilities. And what we were able to find, and this is really extraordinary, for 95% of those kids who were in contact with TJJD because of a misdemeanor or felony offense, we went back and found their arrest histories. That's really extraordinary um, uh, and really unlike anything we've seen anywhere else in the country. Those records, all identifying information was stripped from them, an IRB process was went through. So in other words, everything you're about to hear is a totally kosher uh, study in terms of meeting the standards of uh, top academics across the country. Um, and what we were able to do um, was um, really look at a study period um, <coughs> eligible group of about 183,000 youth. Um, we then asked the question, who, which of those youth could have been incarcerated because of the offenses they committed? Uh, that was about 60,000 youth. Uh, and what we saw there was uh, then uh, pulling that apart <coughs> into two groups. Uh, one that was affected essentially before the reforms were enacted, that's uh, 2005 and 2006, and another post-reform cohort from 2009 to 2011. So that's roughly about 60,000 youth uh, divided into two categories, a pre-reform and a post-reform group. Um, this study was made possible, as I mentioned earlier, through this partnership with Texas A&M's PPRI, uh, as well as the Justice Center. And then uh, we had these great partners, uh, not only uh, at the state level, but as we'll also talk about the counties. And the counties were a fantastic partner in this. They opened themselves up uh, for the report authors to actually visit them and do a number of uh, interviews and studies of what's actually happening on the ground level. So this isn't just basically a numbers analysis. This is also the result of an extensive qualitative analysis. And we also checked in with the top guns nationally on these topics, Dr. Lipsy uh, and Dr. Mulvey uh, extensively published on this topic and they gave us some great advice along the way. You've heard the role of key funders and I also want to underscore the help that the uh, U.S. Department of Justice and the Office of Juvenile Justice and Delinquency Prevention in particular provided to make this study possible. Okay, please get to the findings already. That's what we really want to hear, right? Um, so here I am. Um, I'm going to now walk you through a number of questions uh, that this report answers that we are very excited uh, to see other states address as well. The first question. We know the number of um, youth has declined, but to what extent is that a result of what the state actually did? We've seen uh, populations decline in other states that haven't enacted sweeping reforms like Texas did. Um, so you know, to what extent can we actually connect those two things? And while it happened, what happened to crime rates? Because at the end of the day, nothing is more important than public safety. And we want to know, is the state safer uh, since this has actually happened? Um, what I'll walk you through right now are patterns uh, and trends before the reforms were enacted. And you'll see here from 2004 to 2006, no changes uh, in the total number of admissions um, that had occurred. If you look at the average daily population, it was about level, about uh, a 2% decline. And then we look at the average length of stay, that had dropped about 2%. So right before the reforms, you see a number of key indicators all holding about steady. And then when we go after the reforms, we see this huge decline in admissions, which we can in fact peg, uh, for example, to the fact that you prohibited the incarceration of misdemeanants um, in the state-run facilities. Um, we can also see a then significant decline in the average daily population. The length of stay um, did decline, but not dramatically. Clearly, it's the uh, drop in the numbers of kids who are coming into the system that is driving this decline, and that decline in admissions, a key factor, has been the reforms uh, that were enacted. One of the questions was, you know, did this actually affect the racial composition of the population? Many of you know, especially if you've walked through these facilities, you're talking about facilities that are overwhelmingly kids of color, African American and Latino youth in particular. What we saw here was a proportional decrease uh, in the uh, percentage of commitments that were non-white. In other words, if you look at whites, uh, Hispanics, and African Americans, there were declines in each group so that the racial disproportionalities are about the same as they were before the reform. So the declines, yes, in the overall numbers, but the percentages, the ratios remain relatively similar. The big question, I think this is the one that we uh, are particularly excited to see, is that while the state uh, reduced the numbers of kids in confinement, Texas experienced a significant decline in the number of kids who were arrested. That's our best uh, proxy 
for uh, juvenile crime is what kids are being arrested. And we did see a significant decline uh, in the youth arrest rate uh, during this period. So uh, that's important. At the same time, it's worth noting that other states have also experienced a significant decline in their arrest rate. So uh, this isn't unique to Texas. Um, but what's exciting here is that you've demonstrated that you can reduce the number of kids in confinement uh, by about 4,000, as Senator Whitmire noted, um, while seeing a significant decline in the number of kids who are arrested, which should be noted are in the tens of thousands each year. So here's the next question, which is, what was the impact on local pro uh, juvenile probation departments? Did, in fact, this whole population get shifted uh, to the responsibility of juvenile probation departments, and are they dealing with more kids as a result? This is where it gets kind of naughty, the data, but I think you'll find it really interesting. If we looked at the total number of dispositions in FY05, it was a little over 92,000. If we looked in particular at those kids adjudicated to probation, that's that light blue shade that you see there, uh, that's a, a little over 26,000 kids. So uh, you'll see that that's what it was before the reforms were enacted. You'll see that the total number of dispositions that occurred in FY12, much after the reforms were enacted, uh, far fewer uh, dispositions, and you'll see that there are far uh, fewer kids who are adjudicated to probation. We see this as related in large part just to the decline in arrests that had occurred, but to see a major transformation in the number of kids that juvenile probation departments are seeing didn't see that increase uh, that was anticipated. Uh, you'll note the light green uh, shade there. This is a really interesting uh, particular slice of the pie. That shows you what percentage of dispositions were resulting in confinement in state run facilities. You'll see that it was almost 3% um, before the reforms. Now a far fewer, or a much smaller percentage of kids are actually, or dispositions are resulting in confinement. So again, seeing here that more kids are staying closer to home. What we are seeing though is that a greater percentage of dispositions to probation are resulting in placement in local juvenile probation, in, in local residential secure and non-secure settings. So what this means is that when we look at what we saw as trends before the reforms and then what we would have expected based on different patterns uh, to have seen, we saw that really because of the reforms there was a significant decline in the number of kids who were committed to state facilities. But if everything had held steady, we would have actually seen fewer commitments to residential, secure, and non-secure facilities. There was a little bit of a bump up in the number of kids who were being, uh, <clears throat> the percentage of kids that were resulting in secure and non-secure facilities locally. And what you'll see here is, is that now we actually have more kids on any given day who are in residential facilities, secure or non-secure on any given day, than we actually see in state secure facilities. It is worth noting, though, those kids are closer to home than they were before. They're staying there for shorter periods of time, and it costs a lot less than being in a state secure facility. So question number three, the state has saved a lot of money in doing this. What happened to the money? And you'll see here that the state has really followed through on its commitment to significantly increase the funding to local juvenile probational departments. And when you take that development and add that there are fewer kids under probation supervision today than there were before, you have a significant per youth spending increase um, on kids who are involved in the juvenile justice system. So that today, uh, per youth, we're spending about 70% more money. That's adjusted for inflation than we were about five years ago. So far more money now being targeted to this population, still nowhere near the amount of money that we spend, you know, $130,000 a year when a kid's incarcerated. And you can see here, though, and this is important, that even despite that increased state investment, that county money continues to be the primary source of funding for these juvenile probation departments. Nearly three quarters of these budgets continue to be funded by the counties. Um, so what happened? What did, what did they do with that money, right, now that we see that more money is being spent per youth? Well, we can see here that um, more youth are being placed in programs. We can see here that um, more youth are spending a longer periods of time in uh, non-residential uh, community programs. And you also see that um, youth are being put in more programs. So in other words, uh, you have youth who are being put in two, three, four programs who might have been placed in fewer programs before. So a lot more exposure to programs uh, than, had prior, than had been the case prior to the reforms. What in particular are they doing with the dollars? We can see an increase here. Um, you'll see here where we went from about 5.3% uh, of overall money to about 6.5% uh, going to um, uh, community-based and local funding. And you'll see also probably the biggest uh, increase in, in where the money has gone has gone to excuse me to residential, secure, and non-secure facilities. 
So we know that the money has resulted in increased exposure to programs for youth. Let's go now to question four, which asks the question then, are they doing better in the community than they would have in a state secure facility? Now, if we just simply looked at kids who are under community supervision versus who are released from state, sec state secure facilities and looked at ar arrest rates, you'd see here that arrest rates are high no matter who you're looking at, whether they're under uh, community supervision or whether they're released from a secure facility. And you'd see here that, according to this gray bar, kids under probation do better than kids who are released from a state secure facility. Easy, right? Open and shut case. Well, anybody looking at these data, though, is going to come back and say, wait a minute, you know, you've got 30,000 kids under probation supervision, you know, uh, uh, a couple thousand who are coming out of state secure facilities. Those kids who are coming out from state secure facilities are much higher risk youth. They've been doing more serious things, so you can't compare those two sets of youth. So you, you can't conclude from this, uh, in fact, that youth who are under community supervision do better than kids coming out of state secure facilities. This is where the amazing work of Texas A&M comes in in doing some pretty impressive modeling. We were able to look at all of these different characteristics of the youth, their age, their race, but also a whole host of criminal histories, different kinds of treatment needs, and we were able to control for all those variables. We also were able to look at all the characteristics of the counties to which they were returning. So all the variables you can think of that is going to make a youth distinct from a youth coming out of uh, a youth under probation supervision distinct from a youth coming out of a uh, state secure facility, we were able to control for all those things. And we were able to look essentially at their likelihood of arrest, comparing an apples to apples group coming out of a state secure facility and under local probation supervision. Here's what we found, and this is one of the most important findings in the presentation. We found that looking at nearly identical youth, one under uh, community supervision and one coming out of a state secure facility, those youth under community supervision were 20% less likely to be rearrested than kids coming out of a state secure facility. And what's even more important, I think, is that when kids are getting arrested coming out of a state secure facility, they're far more likely, three times more likely, to be rearrested for a more serious offense, a felony offense, uh, as compared to kids who are under community supervision. So the next question um, is, uh, when we look at youth who are under community supervision, what kind of programs are having the greatest impact? And one of the things that I, I didn't show you right there, but it is really important, for as much as we can say that kids who are coming, who are under community supervision are doing better than kids who are coming out of state secure facilities, we can't say that kids under community supervision today are doing better than kids under community supervision five years ago. In that regard, we haven't seen much improvement. And so we wanted to look at what programs are making the most difference. And here it's important to point out, we did not do any program evaluations. What we had the unenviable task of doing was looking at all of the programs in particular counties. And I'm just going to give you an example. Um, uh, I hope you'll bear with me, Director, where I highlight Dallas, for example. There are lots of different programs that you have in Dallas. Uh, one of the programs, for example, is called like the Big Thought Program, I think. We had to determine, basically, looking at the Big Thought Program, whether the Big Thought Program was a mentoring program or whether it was a program that was designed uh, to provide cognitive behavioral therapy, we had to categorize these things somehow. Right now, TJJD goes and puts them in 34 different categories. But I think, as you can probably agree, it's going to be fairly subjective as to what the Big Thought program gets categorized when TJJD does this uh, organization. So what we did is we looked at all the juvenile probation departments, we looked at all the different kinds of categories, and we created three particular categories around skill-based treatment and surveillance programs. And then we looked at the likelihood of arrest based on uh, what program the youth went to. And this is probably a, a more discouraging finding, because what we find here is that really it almost didn't matter what program the youth went to. We pretty much see the same likelihood of rearrest. Here we see that whether a youth was put in a uh, treatment program and, or, or a surveillance program, uh, we're basically seeing a similar likelihood of rearrest. Now, all these likelihood of rearrests are significantly lower than uh, kids who are released from incarceration, so that's good news. And we can also see a little bit of a positive impact for the skill-based program. But by and large, this isn't the dramatic impact we would have liked to have seen uh, for kids who are being put in programs when we can see that kids who got nothing at all pretty much got the same results. 
So the next question uh, really is, you know, you're talking about a state with 254 counties. You've just made sweeping assessments about what's occurring across the state without really understanding that this is 254 different countries uh, within this particular uh, nation state of Texas. Uh, and so what we were able to look at here was uh, 30 counties uh, in particular, the 30 largest counties, and really examine and do that multivariate uh, kind of a modeling that I was talking about earlier. And then we drill down even further into eight counties in particular, and I want to thank these eight counties profusely for opening up their entire shops to, to Nancy Aragona and others to really uh, get under the hood and see what they're doing and then be in a position where they're going to be called out by name uh, in today's analysis. But what we were able to do through what I just described here is look at the characteristics of the youth that were currently um, uh, in contact with the juvenile probation system in that county and predict, given all of these different characteristics, not only the characteristics of the youth, but also the characteristics of that county, what their rearrest rates should be. And then we compared that to what their actual rearrest rates were. And what we found was, and, and these are the actual rearrest rates for the study group, and you'll see here uh, <clears throat> uh, eight counties that we looked at in particular, and you'll see that some counties uh, indeed had for this study group higher rearrest rates uh, than other counties. And we compared that then to what their expected rearrest rates were. And this is one of the most interesting slides uh, in the study. You can see here that some counties indeed ended up having higher rearrest rates than what we had expected. Uh, we had other counties, uh, like Harris County, for example, where the rearrest rate was about what we expected for the study group. And then we had rearrest rates that were uh, um, actually lower than what expected. And so, um, no doubt, uh, you'll want to know what is it that those different counties did to get those better than expected results. Well, we looked at things like, is it because one county spends more money than another county? Uh, is it because they're serving a fundamentally different population? No, the answer turned out to be. Didn't really relate to how much money. Some counties were spending more money and getting not as good results, or some counties were spending less money. So it wasn't purely driven just on how much money was spent. It wasn't based on the kinds of kids that were referred to the system. So what was it then that was causing this variation? Uh, and I will now sort of highlight some themes that we saw across all eight counties and then offer some hypotheses for these uh, uh, results in, uh, in just a minute. First of all, uh, you can see here that no matter what county we looked at, we're seeing a large amount of youth who are at low risk of reoffense going to these programs. So remember when I told you that we're putting more youth in programs than ever and they're getting greater program exposure? Turns out that it's gravitating in particular to low risk youth. Why is that important? Because when we put low risk youth in programs where they meet higher risk youth, what do you think happens? They pick up the bad habits and bad influences of those higher risk youth, and it actually increases the likelihood of recidivism. Or maybe through a very good intention program that requires that youth full and undivided attention 24 seven, they're not having contact now with a parent or somebody else who was a positive influence in their life. So what we're seeing here are these higher than expected uh, 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 rates of participation among low risk youth, which is a cause for concern. Similarly, uh, we're seeing these low risk youth put in these programs when they don't even necessarily have a high need, mental health need or treatment need. And yet we're seeing um, many kids who have acute substance abuse treatment needs not getting any program placement uh, at all. So our hypothesis here, and we looked into this in real detail, was when we actually look at the programs that kids are receiving, does it actually adhere to what the research says needs to happen in order to get those results? And you're seeing a lot of uh, evidence here that not exactly, that in fact, uh, what we're not necessarily seeing is the programs or services being delivered in a way that necessarily uh, adheres to the research. It's our hypothesis that those counties that are getting better than expected results are a little bit closer uh, to fully embracing some of the, that research and greater fidelity to the program models. And I just want to highlight some, some cool things that are going on in the counties because there's a ton of innovation happening here. Uh, just as an example, Tarrant County, which we'll hear from in a little bit, is really doing an extraordinary job diverting youth uh, from the system. Dr. Turner's here, Director Turner, excuse me, you can see here uh, that whereas statewide, 22 percent of youth who are referred to the juvenile justice system are diverted, in Tarrant County, that number is 50 percent. Really impressive, the percentage of the kids that are being diverted from the system. Harris County um, has a real streamlined approach to referring kids to particular programs. It's all computerized and is really cool. Dallas County, and we're uh, thr thrilled to have Dr. Smith here, the director of that system. They have a whole system for holding providers accountable for particular outcomes uh, that we'll hear more about later. 
El Paso uses a dashboard where they can actually report to county leaders uh, results, recidivism results, and what's happening and what different kids are getting that is really easy to understand and easy to digest. So lots of innovation happening across the state uh, in particular counties. Okay, that's a ton of information that I've just gone through and as quickly as I possibly can. Um, what does it all mean? What are the takeaways? Uh, Tony Fabello has always told me, you got to keep it simple. Three points um, is, is what's a, the easiest sort of takeaway for folks. So let me try to give you the three takeaway points. Takeaway number one is that you, Texas, have delivered on a central promise of the reforms. You said kids would do better closer to home. You said you would save a lot of money. You said the state would be safer. All of those things have happened. Congratulations. Not only did you deliver on the promise, you've got the data to prove it, which no other state in the country can do. And so once again, do the two-step. Um, you know, you can actually, I think, provide a model for the rest of the country and what they should be doing. Here's the next question. You still have 100, uh, excuse me, you still have almost 1,000 kids who are incarcerated. As we did an analysis of those youth, we found that it was really hard to distinguish the characteristics of some youth who continue to be incarcerated and youth who are in the community. In other words, it's still a somewhat of a coin toss in terms of some kids who are ending up in a state secure facility and kids who are under community supervision. Is it possible to reduce further the number of kids who are in state secure confinement given these results that you're seeing? And furthermore, recognizing that, that there will undoubtedly be some kids who continue to be confined, how do we do something to improve success rates for those kids when they come out? We're still seeing unacceptably high recidivism rates that have not improved um, over the last five years. So again, takeaway number one, congratulations on the results. They're doing better closer to home. Takeaway number two um, is, I think, the area that we really zero in on for an area for improvement, and that is you're investing more than ever in community-based programs and supervision for these youth. That's the right thing to do. We're not seeing, though, the re results that we think are possible. You can go further in maximizing the return on this investment. The question is, what's the state's role in helping counties? At the end of the day, counties are still shouldering most of the funding that goes towards this. And if you've been in these county systems, and I'm, I'm sure all directors will tell us, it is an overburdened, under-resourced system doing a million things every day. How can the state partner with those counties to really help them get where they need to go? That's takeaway number two. And then takeaway number three is for the rest of the country watching this, um, which is that we think you should follow Texas's lead in examining uh, your system much in the way that Texas had. As I mentioned before, most states have seen a dramatic decline uh, in the number of kids who are, are incarcerated, but you haven't necessarily done this analysis. Now, we also recognize once you turn to your uh, information system people and say, do this analysis like Texas did, they're going to turn around and say to you, we don't have Texas's information system. Um, so I think the question that we'll be asking is, what can those states do that don't have that capacity um, to provide a similar sort of assessment of their system for leaders like uh, Senator Norris and others across the country? And there, we're seeing uh, the federal government and the MacArthur Foundation and others step forward with resources and tools that really can be used to self-assess their systems. And we look forward to partnering with those states to do that kind of analysis so they don't have to wait um, until they have a new state-of-the-art information system. Thank you, all of you, again, for what you're doing here. It's really, really impressive. Again, I think it's something that propels this country forward. Uh, what I'm excited about, and I always get excited about in Texas, is it's not just a study for the purposes of academia. You're going to do things with that, and we're going to hear about that more uh, as we have our panel discussion. All right, now we're going to go to the panel. OK. Um, so um, I've got the uh, privilege of having a fantastic panel, which I think really here represents the cross-section of perspectives that are really going to be key in responding to what we've heard today and, and moving forward. Uh, and I'm just going to go down the line and in introducing them, and then I'm going to be asking some questions. Um, but first, we've got the director of TJJD here with us, uh, David Riley. So thank you, Director Riley, for, for being here. I mentioned how uh, instrumental your support has been um, in making the study possible. Um, and we also have two county uh, directors, directors of county juvenile probation departments, where, as we've heard from this uh, report, the thousands of youth are every day. Uh, Dr. Terry Smith from Dallas County, uh, who's the director of the juvenile probation department there, uh, and Director Randy Turner uh, from Tarrant County uh, Juvenile Probation Department. Uh, panelists that I'm particularly grateful for being here for today, because at the end of the day, 
always thrown at you are a gazillion statistics and numbers. Um, and nothing is a substitute, as Senator Whitmire will tell you, for the perspective of somebody who's actually living this system on a day-to-day -day basis. Uh, and um, we are thrilled to have Ms. Rowland here, um, who's a parent, uh, whose son Christopher is here with us today. Uh, Lakisa Rowland is here uh, from Dallas County. Uh, I'll introduce her. Um, more later, um, but she has a first-hand experience for what it's like to be the parent of a youth who's coming through this system uh, and really uh, how challenging that is and also some lessons learned from parents, uh, uh, for parents everywhere. Uh, and then Senator Whitmire uh, will certainly invite you to jump in whenever, um, but then also looking forward to hearing you make closing remarks uh, for all of us. So uh, that's our panel. Um, I want to start with uh, Director Riley. Um, you know, we just opened the fire hydrant, uh, Director Riley, through a ton of data at folks. Um, can you tell us sort of uh, what you took away from this study and uh, what you think it means for your agency? I will. Thank you, Michael. I, I, I'd like to just to take a second to recognize and thank Senator Whitmire. Michael Griffiths, I don't know if Mike is here today or not, um, and Dr. Fabello for having the conversation two years ago, really having the insight and the wisdom to talk about this then that brings us to where we are today. And, and, and we're at a good place today. This is a good day for Texas and juvenile justice. Um, what this report's going to do for us is uh, provide us a, st a strong basis to refocus ourselves on outcomes, on results. And that's where the focus ought to be, regardless of what we do. Outcomes is what we should always be looking at. And this gives us the jumping off place to do that. It gives us a benchmark that we can measure ourselves against as we go down the road in efforts to increase our own effectiveness. Whatever the recidivism rate is, and, you, and you've seen some rates up here today that reflect where we've been. Whatever they are, even if it was half of what that number is, that wouldn't be good enough. The people that work in this system, in this field, believe that we can always do better. And it's through studies like this that enable us to get there. So for me, I'm the, I'm the new guy on the block here, um, at least in Austin. And um, if there was one thing I needed when I came, it was a blueprint for what we needed to do as a system, not just on the state facility side, but also our partnerships with the counties. And this gives me a wonderful blueprint for how we ought to be refocusing our partnerships as well as looking at the state facilities. So I'm very excited about this. Um, this is a good day for us. Thank you, Director. You know, uh, two of the things I mentioned at the end, one was that there continues to be uh, roughly 1,000 kids who are in state secure facilities and mentioned that uh, many of them have profiles that are nearly identical uh, to kids who are under juvenile probation supervision. What do you think, um, you know, as, as the legislature convenes, you know, your thoughts on uh, the right size of the system? I think our system, I, I don't have a number for you, but I will tell you that I believe that the kids, the young kids, the youth who ought to be in the state facilities ought to only be those kids who cannot be managed or treated effectively outside of the state system. All the other kids ought to be smaller facilities and less secure facilities if possible, closer to their homes, closer to their communities, where they're going to be going back to anyway. And Director, if I can ask you to speak a little louder. If you move the microphone a little closer, that'd be great. Thank you. Um, I was asked if, if, if there are ways we can further reduce the population in the state facilities, and I believe there are. I believe there are current ways we can do that now, um, and we're already moving in that direction without additional resources, but the, and, that, and that would be the short-term view. But the long-range view is that the state model we have now for our facilities was developed at a different time, a different point in history of juvenile justice in Texas. It's not where we are today. The model we have today limits our ability to produce good outcomes, and we just have to acknowledge that and look at other ways to conduct business at the state level. There have been other ideas presented over the years, and I hope that we can get back to discussing some of those options for how we can develop, how we can become a more regionalized uh, program at the state level as well, and have smaller facilities closer where kids live, less secure, less prison-like environments, less costly facilities and campuses. But that would be the long-range view. In the short term, we are attempting now to expand our provider base so that those kids we have in our state facilities today, we should never have a, a child in a state facility that, that, that could be managed in a smaller local facility. That just shouldn't happen. So we're attempting to increase our options by con expanding our contracts 
with the existing residential treatment centers um, who can take some of our kids now. Um, we may need some uh, legislative assistance and the flexibility involved in our funding, uh, but uh, I, would, I, will, I, will, I will tell you a number. I asked the staff that were here today, as a matter of fact, a few months ago to tell me just an estimate from uh, you know, their knowledge and their work. How many kids they thought we had in the facilities that day that could be served and managed in a, in a medium secure facility? It's only 70%. So as we expand our provider base, we're also going to be looking at the criteria we use internally to decide when kids can be uh, discharged to a, uh, a less secure facility in a better environment. So short term and long term, there are, there, are, there are directions from us in this report that we are already moving forward. Director, one of the things that I think is, is particularly neat that you and your department have done in, in response to this report, and I think, again, it models the kind of reaction we'd like to see from uh, your counterparts across the country, is you know, you've got 165 juvenile probation departments right across the state. Uh, how do you work with them to basically understand uh, where they are uh, you know, in terms of what actually works to improve outcomes and then what a pathway forward might look to be? Can you talk a little bit about the the kind of uh, assessment you're trying to help those counties go through? I think I can. I, uh, as I've thought about that, I think there are several things um, that we need to, you know, refocus ourselves on in regard to our partnerships with the county. I, I just came from uh, a county where I was for 17 years, so a lot of that experience, of course, is still with me. But as you mentioned, Michael, there are things that we know now from this reform effort that have worked, and the counties have done a great job in keeping more kids at home. Uh, to what extent they can even grow that, we don't know, but we, are, we need to find that out. So we ought to be looking at ways to increase our support to the counties to enable them to develop more services, expand on what they have to keep more kids in the local communities. That's first. There are prevention programs that exist now in the state um, and have been funded by the legislature, and we ought to be looking at those programs and finding ways, to, finding the ones that are working and producing good results and there are those, and expand them. We need to find ways to, we need to help the counties replicate those kind of practices that are working now. Um, another way that we intend to uh, further the partnership is to look at how we can target funding. I know this is a very sensitive issue for a lot of folks, but how we can target funding to uh, outcomes a little bit differently than we have in the past. We really have an obligation to do that. and. Um, we need to take a really good hard look at how to do that best. And I think if we work together in a partnership uh, uh, method, we can do that. Thank, um, you. Okay, that's right. <clears throat> Thank you, Director. And it's one of the things you'll read the full report we really talk about is the, the grant programs that exist now and how those can be tied, not simply as a formula, right. Right. but really exactly. trying to see you know, how is that money used to actually improve outcomes um, for youth? Uh, Dr. Smith, uh, the director of the Dallas County Juvenile Probation Department, um, you know, you've got a, a huge agency just in Dallas with 1,100 employees, I believe, um, and, uh, you know, you've got a, a whole board to respond to at the county level. Uh, you're one of the counties that we saw that actually got better than expected um, rearrest rates given the population that you're serving. Uh, everybody's going to be asking, what's the secret to your success? Um, and, you know, what do you need in order to double down on that? Um, so reactions that you have and other thoughts. Um, well, first and foremost, I want to say thank you for everyone who's here because I know your interest is in what we can do better and what we can do best by kids in, in Texas and even from other states. Um, I thank Senator Whitmire and his team for having the leadership to say we need to look at this and look at the data. For those counties who were part of that data, it was very anxiety producing because no one likes to be scrutinized and it's like, oh my goodness, what are they going to do with the data? So no matter where we fall on that spectrum, whether it's better than expected outcomes, lower than expected, or as expected, it's a springboard for all of us. So you never sit by and say, that this is that. We are, Dallas is an Annie Casey JDAI site, which has a great eight core strategies for us in place. 
and that is addressing the needs, all decision points in our system. So that means from intake to law enforcement to our judiciary, and I'm very cognizant to say that it takes that perfect storm. You have to have a judiciary who is very invested in doing right by kids and putting youth first. You have to have a district attorney who is willing to look at felony cases and say, okay, we can try this. You have to have probation officers who are invested, um, community partners, so it's not just an individual or individuals, it really is the team approach for how we address and how we look at kids. And then from this report, my takeaway is, what can we do better? What, what can we do three years out still looks abysmal, in my opinion, on the rearrest rate. So we've got to do something. So I can't wait. I'm, I'm one of the geek squad. I can't wait to read the data that shows how are we losing kids from one year rearrest to three year rearrest. What does that look like? How can we address that and never stop? We evaluate all of our providers. If they're not meeting the needs of the kids, they're out. It's just really simple. You don't want to keep paying someone to produce less than expected outcomes. That just makes no sense to us. And now that our referrals have dropped, it's a perfect market because they want, they want to work with our kids to say, if you're going to work with our kids, this is what we need to see. So it's, it's, I don't think there's any magical thing that Dallas is doing than any other county who is invested in doing right by kids. We just happen to have a county that's got great judiciary, our district judges, a, an invested juvenile board, wonderful um, community <coughs> partners who up to now have not said no to us, which really helps us you know, on the back end, aftercare. Because if you don't have kids engaged, then you're going to lose a whole generation. So it's, 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 it's Dallas just has a wonderful partnership at this particular time for those counties who may struggle, we utilize data. You know, sometimes you cannot argue with data. You try to. We do make data-driven decisions. And we show judges, well, why wouldn't you release them from a re detention hearing when 92%, if you appeal, get released anyway? So what? why would you hold them, you know, two days longer in detention when you can release them on the front end? So it's a lot, and then and then utilizing that data. So that's what we do. Um, I'm sure a lot of other counties do that because some counties could say they could say, who cares? But but it does take a lot to ensure that we can produce the outcomes that are really best for kids. Thanks, Director Smith. Uh, we have another terrific uh, chief probation officer, uh, the director of a juvenile probation department with us in uh, Director Randy Turner uh, from Tarrant County, Fort Worth, Texas. Um, director Turner, your thoughts on the study? Great. Thank you, Michael. Uh, as everybody has already said, first of all, thank you. Uh, thank you to uh, the Council of State Governments, to Tony uh, Fabello and his team and, and the work that they have done. Uh, on this research project, and, and I also want to mention the parallel work that's been that's evolved around core principles uh, that has already been published about addressing improve, how to improve outcomes for kids uh, in our system. Uh, and you know, being one of the counties that didn't have as good of results is what we'd like to see. Um, you know, I think this is an opportunity for us to periodically get out of the weeds, uh, get out of what we do on a day-to-day -day basis and uh, really just take a much closer look at, at our decision processes, our business practices, and make that happen. Um, you know, there's, as, as uh, Dr. Smith, as Terry has mentioned, uh, so much of this work is about a collaborative effort. It is the work that has to take place between our local probation system, uh, our courts, our prosecutor's office, our defense attorneys, uh, everyone that uh, comes to the table with stakeholders to ensure that this work gets done. Uh, leadership from, from within your department, uh, Benny Medlin and Linda Brook from my executive team are here today and, and just provide that focus and diligence that it takes to make sure that those right decisions are being made. Uh, certainly this is a first for Texas. Uh, I think it, the study has already talked about uh, all the massive improvements that have taken place. Um, local ju juvenile justice practitioners uh, have uh, stepped up to the plate. We've done more with more kids, um, but again, as, as Terry mentioned, we can't be satisfied with where we are today. Uh, there's always got to be improvement. 
there's got to be a way for us to um, uh, improve the lives of the young people who come in contact <coughs> with our systems. Uh, and with that in mind, I would like to just, you mentioned the, the diversion uh, piece, and uh, I'd like to just talk about that just for a little bit. Um, you know, as, as part of the study and a part of the, uh, the core principles talks about is an assessment tool. Uh, we were uh, fortunate enough to implement and utilize a, an assessment process starting back in 2009, which has really enhanced our ability to make better decisions based on risk and need. Um, our data quality has been improved because of leadership from, from our county and other counties and, and now through TJJD to develop a new case management system that is referred to as TechShare Juvenile, is commonly known as kind of a JCMS or Juvenile Case Management System. And because of the development of that resource, we're able to look at data much more effectively. Um, and quite honest with you, for the first time in Tarrant County, we've really taken a step forward based on this research to gather the data um, and worked with, this, uh, with TJJD to look at a data set of all of our kids since 2009. And we just got that data, so um, we'll be taking a much more deeper dive in looking at our work. Uh, so I think that's the type of thing that this research uh, projects us into the future, uh, and it certainly provides a background for us to do that. So I have a follow-up question for both of our county directors here. This may be a practically unique opportunity when you have the undivided attention of the Senate chairman of the committee that's going to be talking about this issue, the director of TJJD, the chief justice of the state Supreme Court. Um, lots of counties are going to be looking at this and just going to be a heavy sigh, right? Uh, and, and, and by that I mean that uh, they've got a ton of different issues that they're dealing with. Uh, and they look at this and your counterparts, you know, I don't control necessarily what kids come to me. You've got, you know, you said it earlier, Director Smith, you've got judges, you've got prosecutors. You know, I've got programs that I would love to end, but I've got somebody, you know, in the city council who adores this program and they want to keep it funded, right? And there's just all of these different things that I got to deal with, so don't lay all this on me. And by the way, you know, the majority of the funding continues to come from the counties. You now have the state that's looking to try to help. I won't put that in quotes, right? I think they're trying to help, but we know counties are always concerned about help from the states. What do you, what do you think that the state can do, recognizing that they're saying there's got to be something about these re-arrest rates that you can do? There's, you, you know, we know that you're not close enough in terms of the program models, in terms of what needs to happen. How can we help you? What, what, what could be the greatest help? And as, as we pointed out, it's not just an issue of more money. Um, so what, what are your thoughts, Director Turner, Director Smith, about how the state can be most helpful? Um, Go ahead. Uh, <laughs> Thank you. Can't little piggyback thing. off of you. Um, great question. Great question, Mike. Um, several things, actually. When we look at diverting, I heard the statistic um, that there's a thousand kids still left in TJJD, what we can do, it, whether we call it a suspended commitment or no matter what we do, using funds on the front end to probation departments, giving them the resources instead of putting them on back end, put it on the front end. Um, we, you're right, we can't control who comes to us, but we can control our programs, looking at what works? So many times, Martinson in the 70s said, with few and far exception, nothing works. But I think we've come so much further than those times, and now we're seeing what works. This study, Dr. Fabello's study, um, shows what works in a lot of counties. So it's replicating what works, getting rid of what doesn't work, and then it actually takes a lot of conversations, meetings, to determine how we go forward and how we can help TJJD um, work with the kids that we want to keep in our, it, closer to home is better for our kids. It works on reunification. It's better for the families. It's better for the kids. We should never strive to send kids far away from their home, out of state, if possible. They, we need to keep them with their families. So it's just a continuum. We have to <laughs> continually look for what works for our kids using the data. What does the data show us? Do we have more felony kids who are 15 who don't have a high school education? What does it show us? Not anecdotal, but just really, really take a hard look at what your individual county data shows you because what I have may not be acceptable for Lubbock County. So you have to take that internal look at your own county and see what does the data show you. Who are your kids that you have in your system and then work it from there. 
Director Turner. Great. I, again, I can piggyback on, on, on what, again on what Terry said. Um, no, we, when we started talking about reducing commitments to the state, one of the things that we really started talking about in Tarrant County is reducing kids coming into the system, period. Mm -hmm. And the more we can do at that front end of the system um, to divert kids and going back to some of the results of the study, uh, putting low-risk kids into high-risk program intervention strategies. Um, as I said, we we got uh, we have the opportunity to implement our assessment process. We're just now getting to the point where we really feel like we've got the data, we have we have the information that we need to now make better decisions to tie uh, young people at low risk. And, and I think I heard Nate make the comment about the right intervention for the right kid for the right amount of time. Um, and if we have that kind of flexibility with our, whether it's a state funding, whether it's the use of our local funding, uh, to be able to do that. 53% um, of all the referrals that we uh, received in 2014, uh, we diverted through a supervisory caution action and diverted them. And doesn't mean they don't get services. We provide them short-term intervention. Some, uh, they may be involved in mediation. Uh, but that allows us to really focus our energies where we should focus our energies on high risk, maybe some moderate risk kids, and really matching those kids with the right service. Uh, and I think that's uh, a big piece where the state can help us with the data. Uh, a lot of the departments across the state don't have the luxury that some of the larger departments have. We have our own research team uh, to be able to do that. And I think that's that's going to be a real critical piece uh, where the state can help us. Well, one of the things that I hear both of you saying, and, and correct me if I'm getting this wrong, but, but one thing that we're, we're really talking about here is a shift where you have leaders I think you said this earlier, Director Turner, coming out of the weeds and asking Absolutely. about the outcomes for those youth, not just necessarily, okay, here's a kid, how do I put him in a, or her in a program, mm -hmm. but what difference is it making in that kid's life? Um, and actually asking, you know, what the actual outcome is. First and foremost, hopefully diverting the kid from the system altogether, exactly. uh, but then recognizing when there is that penetration, you know, how do we make sure that there isn't uh, additional involvement, unnecessary involvement in the juvenile justice system. And I hear you both saying that would be a shift in the mindset um, in, uh, for a lot of systems. And uh, just an added component to that, I don't think outside of those in this field understand what juvenile justice really is, what, what probation departments really do. We have a high profile kid and, and they're saying right now, what do y'all do? We don't know what you do until it's a high profile case. We have to do a better job of letting the community know that if we release a child, crime's not going up. You know, they, they need to know that our, our rates of juveniles coming into our system are being reduced. So we're still keeping the community safe. Crime is not rampant. We don't have the super predator. And so it's all of those things that go into place of ensuring that the community knows that the kids that we want to keep are the ones that may not work well in your community until we can get them some resources. So it's it's all of that knowledge too that we have to do a better job of letting them know what we do do. We're, we are making an impact and this report <clears throat> is going to go such a long way with showing them, you know, this is what works for our kids. So we're really excited to have something we can just hand to them and say, look, we're, we're doing good things. Yes, Senator Whitmire reminded us at the beginning of the session that the combination of the of the public attention on the state secure system um, and the uh, TYC facilities at the time, you know, plus just the eye-popping amount of money that's spent per kid, mm -hmm. causes a lot of state folks to immediately focus on those kids in state secure confinement. Mm -hmm. But you know, th these numbers just keep reminding us that you're talking about you know whether it was 4,500 a few years ago or closer to 1,000 today. That's just a tiny fraction mm -hmm. when you look at the. 60, 70,000 kids disposed sure. through the system each year and the 30,000 kids under juvenile probation. And I think you're a reminder of just how important it is to use that as a focal point, the juvenile probation departments. Um, so again, I mentioned earlier, sort of we need to get past the numbers and talk about real people's lives. Uh, and Ms. Rowland, I can't thank you enough for coming down here from Dallas and, and for coming with your son. Christopher, thank you for being here. I know you're the parent of three wonderful kids. Um, and um, you know you have a history of, of working in the private sector, um, but uh, one of the things that really excited us about getting to connect with you 
um, was just how involved you got uh, in the system and really beginning to try to understand what is, uh, seems to many of us like an incredibly complicated bureaucracy. Um, you actually waded into it uh, and tried to sort it all out. Um, and for that, we applaud you. Uh, we'd love just to hear about you know, your own experiences uh, with the juvenile probation department and your advice to parents everywhere. Great. Uh, again, I just want to say thank you for allowing me this opportunity to be a part of this movement. Um, as parents, we don't see what happens beyond, you know, behind the scenes. We just know that we're parents and those are our babies. And sometimes as parents, we have a tendency to like uh, enable our children. And we look at, we don't want them to get locked up, but we need to realize as parents where you set a boundary between, yes, you do need discipline. There has to be um, uh, accountability. And on the flip side, it's like, for instance, like when I first got thrown into the system with my son, it was like countless referrals for truancy, uh, delinquent behavior as far as um, classroom disruptions. So as a parent, all you look at is like, I'm so overwhelmed with fines, fees, court calls, all these counseling mm -hmm. sessions that I'm paying for. You have like married couples, you have single parents. Then you all you look at it, you don't look at it as a standpoint of let me help in my child. You just look at it, I'm so sick and tired of paying fees and being in this court, I'm gonna lose my job. I lost countless jobs behind my son. But after a while, it got to a point when I said, you know, when you go before the judge, they don't want to talk to the parent, they talk to that juvenile and they state what the offense is. Then finally, I stated, hey judge, help me to help my child. I think it starts at the school level and it gets thrown into the criminal justice. The public school system doesn't know how to deal with our children or they just don't want to deal with our children. On the flip side, it's that a parent's making a stand saying, hey, there's something wrong. Okay, it's my child. It, it could be different scenarios, but mine was like education and learning disabilities. Even though there's no even because you have a learning disability doesn't give you the right to still act out, but you have to understand what you're dealing with. So you really haven't gotten to the core of the problem. So it's dumped into the criminal justice system to let you figure it out because we're not going to deal with it. So then as you get into the system, you might incorporate different uh, personnel with like different uh, uh, personalities in which at this point the parent is feeling more like, I feel like I'm being punished. So as a parent, my plea for the public is you are the best advocate for your child. Get involved in what's going on with them as far as education. When they're failing, never, never stop asking questions on how to get the help that you need. If you don't get that, you just keep climbing to the top until you get what you need. And after a while, they're going to give you what you want. So we're so sick and tired of dealing with this person. Hey, let's get up <laughs> something, you know? And that's just really my story. And through all of this, so I call my little problem child, it's like, you know, I want to make a difference. I want to get involved in this and not just be the person pointing fingers at the system on what they should be doing, but I want to actually get in and say, okay, what can we do? Like they say, it takes a village to raise a child. So I want to be part of that village to not just, you know what, maybe it didn't help my son then. Maybe it did, but you know what? We can all take our negatives and get positives and help somebody along the way. Thank you, Ms. Roland. You know, question for you. I think everything you're saying makes so much sense, and then I think so many of us ask, how do you, you know, how do you actually work through that kind of have the, the wherewithal? I think was a term we were describing earlier. You know, to to deal with a system that discourages in many ways, right, uh, a, a parent from coming involved, whether by having hearings when you need to be at work, you know, or uh, fines and fees that that you know a lot of people can't afford. Um, you know, maybe there's language issues as well. What, what what kinds of supports could you imagine being able to provide parents who just didn't necessarily take the initiative or wouldn't occur to them to take the kind of initiative that you did? What kind of supports do you think can be provided to them to help navigate this system? You know, like I said, um, I hate to say, but you know, a lot of parents, we don't have the savvy. We don't know the terminology. We don't know the proper way to put this. But the thing is, you know what you want for your child. You know what you're needing. You know what you're up against. Just basically state, what is your claim? What is it that you need? What's going on with you? Voice that to the judge. Voice that to the schools. Voice that to the personnel. Voice it. You're your greatest voice. We have to learn how to use it. Well said. It makes so much sense, right, when you, when you hear it put it that way. So thank you very, very much. Uh, Director Riley, I want you to give you a chance just to respond to what you've heard um, from from our parent advocate and some of our county juvenile probational departments, and we're going to turn it back to Senator Whitmire um, for uh, additional thoughts he has. But 
Director, any, anything you've heard that you want to respond to? Well, I, I, I guess what one big takeaway I have is it, it just reminds me, I, I think, of uh, our commonality um, that we have. We don't always have the same ideas about how to get from point A to point B, but we all agree on what point B should look like. So uh, continuing the dialogue um, with the counties, with our partners, um, asking for ways, as you did, Michael, what, what, what can the state do to help you all uh, do the kinds of things you're expected to do and that we expect you to do? How can we help you do that? Um, recognizing that we do have that in common and we do have that huge commonality that uh, we're on the same page about where we want to get to. So how we get there, we can have a lot of discussions about that, and we should. But I, I am very encouraged. I am very optimistic. Uh, I said earlier, I think, that this is a good day for Texas juvenile justice, and I, I, I deeply believe that. I think we're on, we're, we're going to take it up a little bit higher. So, Mr. Chairman, Dean, you've heard um, a lot of people say we agree on point B, just not sure how we get there, and everyone knows you're going to be instrumental in getting us there. So, um, uh, your thoughts and reaction to the conversation today and what it means for the legislature going forward. First, I leaned over and told Mrs. Rowland, you must be looking at what I write down <laughs> as it regards to it begins at our schools. When uh, Randy and Dr. Smith both said the real objective is to not have youth in our system at any level, I quickly wrote down, you do that first with quit criminalizing school behavior, which we've worked very hard on with council, uh, quit uh, suspensions and expulsions. They get a profile, they get a, a case number, a truancy, criminalizing it. So that's a, it way upstream. And I think Dr. Smith emphasized this is a system, whether we're talking about the adult, but today we're talking about the juvenile. It does begin, obviously, at home, if there's a home in, uh, involvement, but right up through the system. Uh, a couple of things I want to comment on. First of all, uh, we not only have to educate lo local communities, but the legislature. I got nine freshman senators, and I bet you, in all due respect, in fact, I'll use somebody that used to be here. Steve Ogden was an outstanding chairman of finance from Bryan College Station, Naval Academy a graduate, nuclear physicist on the submarine. And he gave me the opportunity to demonstrate that smart on crime works, that you pay now or you pay later up front. But invariably, when we were funding the programs back in 2007, he would mix up probation and parole. It was not a slip of tongue. He didn't know the damn difference. <laughs> so I would lean over after we adjourned and I said, Steve, Probation's on the front end, parole's at the back end. He'd say, Whitmire, you're not going to get more funding by calling me stupid. <laughs> <laughs> I've changed my techniques. <laughs> but the truth of the matter is, 181 members of the legislature, they have really not a great knowledge as we're drilling down today with what juvenile probation really uh, exists of consist of. Uh, they will have a bad press article about a youth doing something horrendous, obviously violent, and they'll paint with a broad brush. They do not understand, and, and I want to stop right here in case somebody just walked in here, because we actually have the nation listening to us today. I think we have, as you've termed it, closer to home without really, let me spend a couple of minutes on why that matters if you looked at the Texas model before. You're in rural areas if you're not close to home because most of the kids come from our urban settings, Dallas, Fort Worth, Houston, San Antonio, Austin. So you will go to Giddings or Gainesville. You immediately do not have the professional help for mental health issues or drug or alcohol. The obvious is you're away from your family and those court officials that worked with you in the outset. So I just want to paste, put a face on what difference it matters. I, some of my colleagues, remember I just told you I'm dealing with freshmen, will say, oh, you just want them to be comfortable. No, I'm not trying to make them comfortable. I'm trying to turn their lives around. Inner city African-American youth sent to outreaches of 
of West Texas, it's conceivable, not only conceivable, today, a black youth from inner city Houston might spend his whole time in the juvenile justice system in Texas confined in a facility he never sees anybody, a mentor that looks like him. Language skills for our Hispanic community may go to Brownwood and never have an opportunity to speak in his first language. Now you, I know I'm singing to people that are stakeholders and workers, but I'm speaking as much to my colleagues in the public. It matters if they stay in their community. Number two, a lot of my new colleagues are fiscal conservatives, as we all want to be efficient with taxpayer dollars. You know how I'm able to change and make an impact this spring? I'm talking more and more about the child confined in the state facilities, $130,000 a year. You ought to all write that down. About half that in the community. So, Mr. Riley, I applaud your, your leadership. You obviously come out of Bexar County, understand the community uh, process. If your staff said only 77% could be identified one day recently, I would challenge that and say, maybe under the current structure, but if we will work closer with the counties, give them additional, as we did when we started in 2007, let the money follow the child. If we will give these professionals and these committed administrations at the local level the resources, I think you could significantly raise that 70 youth out of the 1,000. Now, here's my dilemma, though. In fact, I kind of am cynical about your numbers. And after being in the legislature 42 years, I have earned the right to be cynical. <laughs> Did someone say we could only get rid of 70 because then you start imploding your OTYC model of having five rural facilities. There is a level of confinement at the state level. If you get below that, that 130,000 is going to go even further up. There will be colleagues of mine that say, no, you're not going to take 70 out of, the, out of the state facilities because I still need my facility in Giddings, Gainesville, Brownsville, Mark, et cetera. The real challenge, ladies and gentlemen, is to get the politics out of a lot of our decisions. You can't imagine the criticism and pressure I come under for wanting to remove the largest employer in Lee County. We closed three adult prisons in the last four years. It's unbelievable. I mean, I literally get threats from county and city officials, Chamber of Commerce. What do you mean in Marble Falls? TDCJ is our largest employer. They use the local hardware store and buy their vehicles from our car dealers. I'm sorry. It's not about economic development. It's about public safety. And it's about turning people's lives around. So we've got a lot of work to do. We've got the data now. I'm excited. I'm charged. I hope you are. The table's been set for us. Both budgets introduced in the House and the Senate this last week give the Juvenile Justice Department a significant sum of money, but it starts with zero programs. Okay? We have five facilities at about 1,000. I suggest we could go a couple hundred more from state confinement with some work and resources. So then we've got to just have a grown-up discussion with my colleagues, five senators and five reps, through your leadership, Mr. Riley, and you're saying the right things, and, and I applaud your staff for being very candid. And when you come before finance, say, the 1950s models of having some youth who have committed felons, it's a tougher population than we, we used to see trunks. This is the old model. 180 acres in Gainesville in about five different buildings. You have lunch here, you have recreation here. If they can control the youth, they have school over here. You, you can't control 300 kids on 180 acres at 130,000 each. We've got to get smaller facilities, have a facility for mental health so we can start classifying and getting those youth special consideration, continue to give the, the county resources. So the table is set to address the old 1950 models of a 200-acre Giddings facility. That worked when you sent kids off to, you know, they were truant and they were misbehaving and talking back to their family. 
you send them there for school for six months or a couple of years. These are tough kids that are being referred. And I think we'll always have the need at the state level to deal with some youth that are probably problematic and too tough for local probation departments to handle. So that'll be addressed. And then another major component, and the, and the budget will be written to address it, is what resources do the county have if we're going to continue to keep the youth in greater numbers in the community? Focusing on mental health, drug and alcohol, and special needs programs. So I need your help. I, I, I'm an advocate. The good news is a lot of the legislature will listen, but it is tough politically to go much further. And that's why this report is so important. We've, we've documented, we've got results, we need parents involved. You, I, I, we've got to provide a system that doesn't put you through what you've done because a lot of parents just would not have your strength and, and capabilities that you've displayed. So I suggest, uh, Michael, we come out of here charged, ready to work. We need to spread the word that we've come a long ways, but we've got a long ways to go. Thank you. I want to just reiterate what I've said earlier, which is um, what makes Texas so special, and it's why we keep coming back here, and that is this uh, tendency and commitment again and again to take this hard, unflinching look at the data. Um, and then, once you see those results, not to shy away from them, but to take them, to tackle them, and then to use them to drive policy forward, which is exactly what you've talked about today. And then furthermore, to have the kind of leadership that you have, whether in the community, at the county level, or at the state level, uh, really seeing just in what capable hands this kind of information um, uh, ends up. Uh, we are extremely grateful uh, to you and everything that you've done. And I just want to thank again our fantastic director of research, Tony Pavello, uh, for making all of this happen. I want to um, end in the way that we started with our fantastic host, uh, Chief Justice Hecht. And Chief Justice, anything you'd like to say in closing? <coughs> I'll just say thanks to um, Coach Whitmire. Um, just be careful and don't tear the doors down on the way out. Uh, <laughs> he's got us whipped up here. Uh, but we uh, convene a discussion like this with a report like this here uh, because the court's hope, uh, and certainly our intention, is that these kinds of policy matters, so important to the third branch, as well as others, will be driven by uh, data and facts and not politics. And so with that uh, encouragement and the good, our thanks to all of the participants here this morning, uh, uh, you're, uh, we thank you for coming.